So thank you for coming to our webinar about applying for jobs in the National Weather Service. This is a webinar that's being sponsored by the American Meteorological Society's Board for Operational Government Meteorologists. And my name is Christine Cruz. I am a lead meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Salt Lake City. Our panel today is Lamont Bain. He's a science and operation officer at Flagstaff. Katie McGee, she is a science and operations officer at Huntsville, Alabama. And Jennifer Stark is the MIC at Boulder. And I'm going to start by um, kind of setting what, how we'll handle questions for this webinar. If you have a question, if you could put it into chat, and I will try to look at it while we're going through the webinar and um, raise it as I can. That's the easiest way that rather than having people just trying to interject questions. Um, and so we're going to start first with introductions and a brief introduction to each of our career paths into the National Weather Service. So I'll start first. And my, like I said, my name is Christine Cruz. I'm the lead meteorologist at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Salt Lake City. I graduated from Penn State in 2001 and started my career in the private sector. I worked at two different companies in the private sector, mostly specializing in either marine weather, utilities, um, natural gas, and um, ship routing, things of that sort. And then in 2003, I actually started my National Weather Service career as an aviation meteorologist at the Aviation Weather Center, which if you're unfamiliar, is part of NSEP, which is the National Center for Environmental Prediction. And then in 2006, I started at the forecast office in Salt Lake City, first what we used to call a journey forecaster, which is now a 512. And then I was promoted to a lead meteorologist several years ago. And so next, Lamont, are you ready? Yeah, I am uh, ready to take the reins. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lamont Bain. I'm the Science and Operations Officer here at the National Weather Service Office of Flagstaff. I graduated from the University of Oklahoma in the year uh, 2011. <laughs> and uh, during my time at the uh, University of Oklahoma, I volunteered at the Norman Forecast Office. And I, you know, I really realized that the Weather Service, that if, you're, if you're a meteorologist, I think uh, one of the, the best jobs out there for you. Um, unfortunately, uh, after I graduated uh, with my undergrad, uh, there was a hiring. So, um, you know, there were maybe a few uh, positions that opened up across the uh, United States. Uh, I, I did on uh, several of them. I uh, came up this little report. Uh, and so for me, uh, the next logical step was to grad school. And I actually went to grad school where I came at, at the University of Alabama in Montreal. And I was uh, fortunate enough to, to graduate, uh, you know, a couple of years there, get a lot of experience, uh, worked on the field project. Uh, but then I also was fortunate enough to be able to, uh, to volunteer at the Huntsville office and continue to kind of gain some experience. So after grad school, uh, the hiring freeze was still in the, into effect. And so I kind of like to see, and I worked for the private sector uh, for a bit down in Houston, Texas. Uh, I worked for a company that was uh, primarily servicing the oil and natural gas industry. So we did a lot of ship routing, a lot of voyage planning, uh, providing weather forecasts for some really remote areas uh, of the world, which really opened my eyes to uh, how fortunate we are to have uh, really just the wealth of observational systems and platforms here in the US, but also the, the numerical weather group that we have you know, really up there in terms of uh, you know a country that you know, pour a lot of money to, uh, in, into meteorology. So really fortunate that I had the opportunity uh, to really appreciate that. Uh, but ironically, six months uh, into that career, uh, the floodgates sort of opened. I think there were over uh, 80 uh, positions in the weather service that opened up. So I kind of uh, entered the, what we were calling the intern draft of uh, 2014, 2013, 2014. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be selected at the National Weather Service Office in Fort Worth, where I spent a majority of my uh, paid weather service career. Uh, I worked my way up from intern all the way to forecaster. I uh, was fortunate enough to be an IMET as well as the focal point there. Uh, and then actually just last year, actually not too uh, not too uh, far removed from this time of year last year, uh, I applied for the science and operations science and operations officer position here. Uh, I applied to that and I've been here uh, since the end of uh, January earlier this year. And it's been uh, really awesome and I think that's all I've got to say. And next up I have Katie McGee. 
Um, so I am the Science and Operations Officer here in Huntsville, Alabama. I grew up just outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. So it was super easy for me to get my undergrad degree at NC State. It was 15 minutes from where I grew up, right in the backyard. Um, so I did marching band while I was there. So shout out to fellow band geeks. And actually, when I started out, I thought that I wanted to go into broadcast meteorology. So I took some courses in broadcast, tinkered with public speaking, figured out that it might not be for me. And so then I looked into the operational side of things. And between my junior and senior year that summer, I did an internship at AccuWeather. And that really helped cement the fact that I wanted to go into operational meteorology. I loved the challenge of forecasting. I loved being able to take that next step and communicate it. And then my senior year of undergrad, I did a volunteer spot with the National Weather Service office in Raleigh. And that just sealed the deal for me. I love the intersection of research and communication and operations. And so that's why I personally chose the National Weather Service for my career. Um, but after undergrad, I, I'm sure many of you might be feeling this. I did not feel like I was ready to step into the professional world. So I chose to go to graduate school. And so I did that at UNC Charlotte in Charlotte, North Carolina, and did a thesis on supercell boundary interaction, really dug a little bit more into the severe weather side of things to prepare myself for that. And then the second year of graduate school, there's this really cool internship opportunity called a Pathways Internship. So I was selected for one of those and went up to what's called the Meteorological Development Lab. That's up in Silver Spring, Maryland. And that is where I helped work on some of the MOS programming, um, model output statistics. I helped work on what's called the National Blend of Models. So very much kind of the underbelly behind the scenes side of the National Weather Service. And really felt that itch to get back into operations and operational forecasting. So a really, really cool thing about Pathways Internships sometimes is you can do what's called a conversion from that Pathways internship into a full-time job, and you don't have to reapply for anything. So if a Pathways spot comes open somewhere you're interested, definitely apply. So I was able to convert into an intern position down in Houston. And then after a couple of years, I came up here to Huntsville as a general forecaster, now meteorologist. And just in February earlier this year, I became the science and operations officer. So it has been a wild journey. I love being here in Huntsville. We're co-located with the uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville, like Lamont said. So sometimes I'll help uh, teach some courses there. I'm going to be adjunct faculty in the spring as well. So a lot of great opportunities anywhere you go in the weather service. So wholeheartedly encourage you. Ask us any questions you want. We're so excited to hopefully have you as our future bosses someday. All right, thank you, Katie. And now Jennifer. Okay, so um, yeah, I saved the oldest person for last, maybe. <laughs> I am, I, next year in 2023, I will be 30 years in the weather service. So um, I started, actually I started not knowing exactly what I wanted to do. A lot of meteorologists that you meet know from an early age that they want to be meteorologists and I didn't have that motivation. But I first went to school after high school. I went to a professional pilots program and I got my um, private pilots license, did a lot of the ground schools and did a lot of simulator training and did some IFR flying and stuff like that. And flying is really, really expensive and they don't give you student loans to fly. So I decided I wanted to go into meteorology because we did take a meteorology course during that. And I transferred from this pilot's program to the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley and got my undergrad degree. And at that time, uh, Pathways students are what they're called now, but several iterations before Pathways, I was a student employee of the Weather Service. I worked up in the office in Cheyenne, Wyoming, while I was finishing up my degree program. And then once I graduated, I was offered a few locations in the Weather Service, and I went to Des Moines, Iowa. And I was there for four years. We went through, as a meteorologist intern, we went through two government shutdowns. We had to wait until we were, I think, GS9 to bid on general forecaster positions. And so I had, I spent four years in Des Moines. Then we had the modernization. I went back to Cheyenne, Wyoming as a general forecaster and then promoted to lead on station. 
I spent about seven years total in Cheyenne, and then I applied for the warning coordination meteorologist position in Topeka, Kansas, and I worked there for four years in that role and probably worked the hardest I ever have in my entire career as the WCM in a severe prone area and uh, just super busy. And I had little kids at the time too, so it was really, really hard. Then I applied for the meteorologist in charge position in Pueblo, Colorado, and I moved there and I was the MIC there for 11 years. And then I applied for the MIC job in Boulder, Colorado, and I um, was successful in that application. And I started the my new job on March 2nd, 2020 up in Boulder. So <laughs> if you can imagine what a unusual transition that was. Along the way, I will say that I, I really sought some additional opportunities to make sure that I was competitive for other positions. So I did a temporary stint as the regional WCM at Central Region Headquarters. I did that for about six weeks. I did an acting MIC job up in Milwaukee when they were they were transitioning several of their management positions. So as the MIC in Pueblo, I did a temp promotion to the GS15 job and worked up there for several months. I also did the NOAA Leadership Competencies Development Program, which is a fantastic opportunity to work on your leadership skills and learning more about yourself, learning more about the agency. And through that program, I did two temporary assignments. One was at Weather Service Headquarters. I worked on the GS 5 through 12 program. And uh, I still, there were, you know, some unintended consequences from that, but I still think it's a great benefit for the meteorologists that are joining our agency today. And my last detail through NOAA LCDP was, um, I worked for the National Transportation Safety Board. So kind of measure, marrying my love and interest in aviation and meteorology. And I did that for probably about three or four months. Some of it was in a remote capacity and some was on site in their office in D.C. So that's about it for me. All right. Thank you, everyone, for the great introductions. Um, first, we're going we're gonna to start with just some tips for applying for jobs in the National Weather Service. There was a change in some of the specificity of what you need to include um, in the last year or so. And so we want to make sure everyone knew the things that you absolutely have to have on your resume or you won't be able to be considered for positions. Um, so First thing, it may seem kind of obvious, but you need to state your citizenship. Even if you're a U.S. citizen, that needs to be stated unequivocally on your resume. If you have a selective service number, that needs to be listed. Um, all of the information for all of the jobs you are including on your resume has to include this information. And just to note that we are recording this webinar and we'll have it up on the BOGOM um, YouTube channel if you miss some of these slides or you want to look back at them. But each position must include your job title. If you're a federal employee, your grade level, your salary, even if you're not paid, you have to state that. Um, you can't just leave it not on there. Your duration of employment, and it must include these start and end dates. And I don't know how they, there was a period where they weren't flexible with this exact nomenclature. I don't know if it's still the case, um, but I would lean towards using this month, month, day, day, year, year type format. The number of hours you work per week needs to be explicitly stated. And then obviously your relevant duties and accomplishments. Um, you need to include all of the colleges and universities you attended, including the degrees and the dates you got those degrees. Obviously your accomplishments. And then this one can be kind of tricky. When you look on USA Jobs for every application, there's a section called specialized experience that's required. I, when I apply for positions, I print that out and I go through word for word and make sure that I'm mirroring that language because, and you'll see in another slide, the people that are reviewing your resumes to see if you meet the requirements to go to the selecting officials, they don't know our jobs. They don't know a lot of, of, of what you might be putting in there that's specific to meteorology. So that's the easiest way to make sure that they know that you're meeting the requirements. And that's what number seven is basically saying. 
is especially for internal candidates, they might not know what a 512 meteorologist does, for example. Um, they might not know what you did in the private sector, even if, if it's really something that people in meteorology know. So make sure what I do is sometimes I'll take my resume and share it with somebody that's completely outside the field and see if they are getting the information that needs to meet that application. Um, don't assume that the specialist understands national weather service jargon, acronyms, or other meteorological acronyms. For example, if you're talking about ASOS as an observation system, they are unlikely to know that that's what that is. So you're going to want to really spell those things out. And then this number nine, um, extraneous information such as hobbies that aren't relevant to the position you're applying to, religious activities, um, those you probably want to leave off your resume. Also, it's super important that you never submit anything with your picture on it um, and do not include your social security number. Those things you might not, you might have a great resume, but it might not make it uh, because they're trying to avoid bias in the application process. And then number 10, I've been on five selection committees, six maybe. And I can tell you that there's, a, there's always a portion of resumes that we receive that haven't been proofread that are filled with typos that are for the wrong position. If you send a cover letter for the wrong position, um, have too much extraneous information, that makes you a lot less competitive. So you want to make sure that you have somebody proofread your resume, proofread your cover letter, and make sure that you're, you're removing all of those typos. You're applying, you have the cover letter for the right position. Um, bonus number 11, be careful with your wording. I've read a few cover letters or a few resumes that said things like, I wrote forecast because no one else was good enough. That, that's almost a direct quote. You don't want to do things like that. You want to keep it professional. You don't want to overstate your roles or positions because people will be able to figure out if you're doing that. You want to be honest um, and be positive. And so a few other tips. Always read the entire vacancy announcement. I have, I, I am 43 years old. I print out the vacancy announcement every single time and just cross through everything to make sure I didn't forget anything because they're long. I go through each question and where I answered that question, I make sure that the question, if it says, have you done um, verification on complex weather? And I said, you know, I did this at a supervisory level. I make sure in my resume that I'm mirroring that language just to make it super clear to the person reviewing it. I print out those questions and go through them. Um, always provide all the documentation as requested. Again, go through and just check it off. Now for current 1340s, that's the series that meteorologists are in the National Weather Service. If it doesn't have the disclaimer that says you don't have to submit transcripts, submit your transcripts. Um, another tip, federal resumes are long. You're not gonna have a one page resume like you hear about in a lot of, of the things that you see on Google. Mine's 10 pages because that's the only way I can get all the information that's required. So you're not, the federal resume rules are very different from non-federal resume rules. And then the last one, you can submit a resume using the USA Jobs Resume Builder. Um, if you're uncomfortable with that, there's, there's, I've heard both sides, pros and cons on both sides. What I actually did for myself was to use the resume builder, take the output, put it in a document, edit it to make it more readable and download it as a PDF and upload it that way. And that worked for me. Um, that's always an option. Now let me just see if there's any questions. <laughs> Don't see any questions. So those are my slides about 10 tips to remember when applying. So now we're gonna shift to the panel part of this webinar. And the first question we have, and any of our panelists can start answering this one, is we all know the applicant pools, sometimes called panels, especially for those 512 entry level positions can be very large. So the panelists, what are some strategies people can use to help themselves stand out from the crowd? All right, I can take this one. Um, I think a great way, especially when we're getting into the formatting side of things, making yourself stand out, have different headers that highlight what sets you apart. Um, if you, you don't necessarily need a minor, but if you've taken extra courses in communication, maybe highlight that and have, you know, different headers for how you have applied communication in some of your forecasting courses or any exercises or labs you've done. Um, have additional sections for volunteer leadership positions, things like that. Call attention to 
what would make you the standout applicant? Um, and, you know, again, you don't have to take a minor, but maybe mix up your coursework with something that can apply into meteorology, like sociology, psychology, a programming language like Python, uh, public speaking, statistics, GIS is going to be a very big thing moving forward. So those are some really unique things you can bring to the table and take advantage of your time in school to help yourself stand out when it comes time to apply for those full-time jobs and help set yourself up for success. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback on what Peyton said, um, you know, I've heard multiple resumes that, you know, they, they talk about how good they are at, at forecasting. And, and certainly that's something that is desirable, but, you know, especially as a SUS, you know, that's kind of our job is to bring you up to speed uh, in terms of forecasting. It's some of those other uh, things that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you're basically you're all in course with something like reality, computer programming. Um, those are the things that I think really, you know, set you apart. Those interdisciplinary type, uh, type activities are, are really, really great. So one thing I wanted to mention is when you're an answering those questions in the application, it will ask you, like, what level you are at various um, skill sets, maybe radar interpretation, could be like forecasting, evaluating data, things like that, especially for meteorologists. Um, if you are applying because you've just graduated from university, whether it's undergrad or grad school, be careful how you answer those questions. Give yourself as much credit as you can, but I would say avoid answering that you're an expert, unless you really are an expert, um, because we will be able to kind of say, well, you've never issued a warning because you're not working in, the, in a weather forecast office if you are applying as a student. So answer them as truthfully, but giving yourself as much credit as you can. Um, Katie mentioned extracurricular, and I think, yes, as long as it kind of coincides with meteorology, but if you were like a resident assistant in the dorms or something like that, that is a great thing to put in your resume, in my opinion, because it shows that you've worked with all types of people. Um, you probably helped resolve conflicts among people. And you took a leadership role and a role of responsibility. One other thing for people that are non-traditional students, I think bringing forth that information is also really important. You know, perhaps it took you a little bit longer to get through your undergraduate program because you were working to, you know, a job and going to school. And maybe it was very difficult for you to get th through that. Or maybe you started in a private sector job and decided, OK, I'm going to go back to school now. Um, and I think you can leverage that to your advantage rather than having us wonder you know, why it took you five years to get through undergrad or something like that. And especially if you talk about that in your cover letter, because I think all hiring officials really value any experience that you can bring to the weather service and different viewpoints in, in the weather forecast office. That's all great information. So I have a follow-up question. Um, somewhat close to what a few of you mentioned. So what is something that people should do if they've graduated and haven't yet been successful with their applications? How can you stay competitive if it's taking you um, one or two years to, if, if you're being very selective, it's taking you a while to get into the National Weather Service. How do you stay competitive between college and that time? I'll, I'll go ahead and start if if you guys don't mind, but I would say keep applying because every round of vacancy announcements that come out, there's going to be varying level levels of applicants. And just because you weren't successful the first time, keep trying. Um, and then the other thing I think I would really broaden the offices that you're interested in applying for. Um, some offices like Boulder can be very competitive, hard to get into. We don't frequently have vacancies. Um, so 
if your heart is set on Boulder, you might be really disappointed. So make sure that you look far and wide for a location that you, you can be happy with. Um, in the meantime, I think, you know, you may have a job in the private sector, but can you find something that kind of fits in with meteorology? Um, maybe working in a private sector meteorology company. Um, maybe you could take some classes in emergency management, something like that. Um, those are just a few thoughts that I had. And this is just Christine. I, I completely agree with Jennifer. Um, what I did, because there was a hiring freeze when I graduated from college, was to go to the private sector and get that relevant operational experience and keep applying the entire time that I was there to, to you know, uh, once the um, hiring freeze got lifted. And that way I had relevant experience that I could use to keep myself competitive. I don't know, Jennifer and, and Lamont, did you have anything to add? Sorry, sorry, Katie and Lamont. You're fine, you're fine. Yeah, I will definitely echo that. Keep applying, broaden, broaden your horizons, broaden where you are looking to come in because it very much depends on what an office needs, what type of skill set do they have a lot of versus what might they be looking to bring in to help diversify their skill sets in the office. What you have is perfect for somewhere at some time. It might just not be that location at this time. So some other things I've seen some applicants do to help stay fresh is maintaining blogs, um, doing some of the forecast challenges. I know um, OU has one and helping make connections at conferences, whether you're in the private sector or you're in a different job sector entirely, you can still try and, if you are financially able, attend conferences and make some connections there and begin networking. Um, and also, you know, potentially you can ask to job shadow at an office so you can see how things are changing and, you know, keep up to date in the meantime, that can help you show that you understand what the weather services needs are. And here's how you've been investing your time since you've graduated to help meet and exceed those needs, not only as they stand now, but how they might stand in the future as well. So there's a couple different ways you can set yourself up there. And, you know, it, it takes so many people multiple times to apply. So it's nothing you're doing wrong. It's nothing horrible about you. It's just, it's just the way it works a lot of the time. So it's okay. Yeah. And I, um, sorry, it sounds like my audio might still be a little on the, the low side. So I'll just try to try to speak, speak loudly. Um, kind of echoing what, what Katie and, and what said. Yeah, just, you know, just keep applying. Um, and again, for, for myself and Christine, I think you mentioned it as well. Uh, you know, I recognize that even after grad school, hey, I, I still can't get into the weather service. What's the next best thing that I can do? And that's to, you know, put myself in a position to where I can continue to acquire that operational um, experience. Um, you know, before you get to that step, however, I would, I would certainly have a, a big advocate for volunteering. And I know sometimes it's really tough, particularly with college schedules. But, you know, as a volunteer, um, you know, if you're not uh, fortunate enough to get a, a step or a step or I guess the pathways now, um, you know, that, that volunteership is really, can really go, um, you know, quite the distance uh, because, you know, you never know that the, if the lead forecast or the general forecaster that you're working with as a volunteer becomes one of those selecting officials and they remember, oh, hey, yeah, this individual came in on their, their, their own time and, you know, they really contributed to our operations. So, um, you know, you can, if you still have the time, if you're still a student now, I, I highly recommend volunteer. But again, um, you know, if you're not, to bridge that gap between when you, when you graduate and, and hopefully when you get into a lot of service, you know, private sector absolutely will give you the opportunity to, to kind of hone in on, on some of those skills. All right, those were great answers. I have one more follow up. So I work in an office that just hired seven new grads. Um, we had a huge turnover. And so I asked them if they were two years ago, what questions would be super have been super useful for them, given that I'm, you know, several years into my career. Um, and the one question that they wanted to put, they really thought felt strongly about posing to this panel was, one that I think is on a lot of people's minds, and that's with increasing college costs, do you still think a graduate degree is necessary for applying for National Weather Service jobs? 
do you feel like a graduate degree has a competitive advantage for positions later in your career? A lot of people are trying to balance potential student loan debt versus competitiveness. And so this was something that they felt would be really useful information. Yeah, so, you know, I don't, I don't mind kind of uh, taking the initial um, stab at, at this question. It's a, it's a really good question. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I think a meteorologist's favorite uh, answer is, well, you know, hey, it kind of depends. Uh, and, and I think it really does. Uh, you know, on one hand, I, I do feel that uh, an advanced degree, particularly in meteorology, um, can be useful or probably, you know, maybe you'll get noticed a little bit more. Um, however, I've seen, um, I've worked with multiple people that have, at advanced degrees in something other than meteorology. Um, and it's likely cheaper too. So a degree in emergency management or GIS or computer programming. Um, you know, I, I think again, we're looking for, at least when, I, when I've when i got a panel, I'll say, okay, who, who has something you need for? What do they have? Does it, does it fit um, what we need here at the office? And I think if you branch outside of meteorology, um, you know, you don't have to confine yourself to just going and getting that MS or PhD in meteorology. Emergency management, because we're, we're working so much more with our partners that now that we're kind of getting out of COVID, you know, that's a that's a really big, um, that can be a really big skill set that you can bring. And if you're looking to go to grad school um, and you're wondering, hey, is this going to help? You know, look at look at something like emergency management or PIS or, or something uh, to, to that degree. Um, I've worked with a lot of people that um, don't have their advanced degrees and, and they're fantastic. So. You know, no, it's not necessarily something that you absolutely have to have. Does it help? Yes, but you don't have to necessarily have an advanced degree um, in meteorology is sort of the point that I want to make. So when I look at applicants and I see that someone has an advanced degree or doesn't have an advanced degree, more often than not, the advanced degree provides, um, oh, I wrote it down here, leadership, ability to multitask, teamwork, perseverance, and helps with their confidence. Um, especially with leadership, you likely have a teaching assistantship or research assistantship. So those are some ways you can help ease the financial burden. But if through your extracurriculars and clubs and other involvements in undergrad, you build that skill set and you're able to highlight that skill set in your resume, then you're going to be just as competitive. If you can show, look, I managed the um, local AMS chapter and I helped balance funds and I organized all of these outreach events and meetings, um, you know, that's that's incredibly competitive. That's very similar in some ways to what a TA does in class. So I think there are definitely lots of ways you can set yourself up to be competitive without needing that advanced degree. But ultimately, that's where that master's can give the edge sometimes is in that leadership, confidence, and multitasking side of things. I'm going to side with Lamont on this one and say it depends. <laughs> um, I think it's really up to each individual choice. Um, you know, it, it really depends. You might be looking at some of the hiring trends in the weather service. If we're in the middle of a hiring freeze, like many of the panelists have mentioned, maybe you do go to grad school for a little while. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you have to complete your graduate degree before applying for a weather service meteorologist position. Um, if you feel really driven to do that graduate degree, I think it sets you up for some of the uh, positions where a greater and deeper understanding of some of the science sciences, um, like a science operations officer position, Katie and Lamont are both in those. I, I might be more inclined as a hiring official to look for somebody that has a, a graduate degree, but not, not necessarily. So, Bringing forth those skill sets, some of the skill sets can be learned on the job as well. So I think if you really apply yourself and devote yourself to um, learning new things and trying new things that make you competitive, it helps you move up in the weather service too. So I don't think your degree, lack of a graduate degree is going to hold you back as long as you continue to apply yourself once you get that position. So I, I'm, I hate to be wishy-washy and tell you 
it depends, but I'm going to, I'm going to do that. <laughs> so I think those answers are all right on track from, from my experience as well, for what it's worth. I have a bachelor's degree. I do not have an advanced degree. Um, and I don't feel like that's ever held me back from my career in the weather service because I just couldn't afford to go to graduate school. I put myself through college. So um, anyway, that's just another data point to that question. And I think unless anyone has anything else for those questions, that part of the questions, I'm going to go to the next question. I don't see anyone interjecting. Okay. Um, so question number two is, what is your advice about formatting resumes and what information should always be included? What's something someone can do on that resume to really stand out? And what's something that you maybe have seen that stood out in a negative way? It's something that people should avoid. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. I think... One of the very first things is make sure that you follow the formatting rules, because I think the most important thing right now is getting through the reviewers of the applications. And in those tips that we had at the beginning that Chris, Christine showed in the slides, it is just imperative that you meet all the requirements of, of providing that information correctly in your resume. Now, once you get through that, it, it comes to the selecting official and in your resume, we want to see um, maybe how you interacted with the weather service. If you were able to do a volunteer opportunity, do you have a reference from the weather service that I can call? Um, what other skill sets? What special um, activities did you do in college that maybe you did the AMS forecasting challenge or some of the other opportunities like that? Um, so I, I think really right now we're seeing a lot of people not meet the fundamental requirements of getting their resume done correctly. So that's limiting how many people we see as selecting officials. So I think it's just really imperative to forecast your resume to get through that process first and foremost. And then also keep in mind that I can't consider Anything that you send to me in email, I only have to consider what's sent to me through the USA staffing, USA jobs. Um, so your resume and cover letter that come with that, that's all I'm going to see about you and that's all I can consider. So I think a cover letter is a really great option to highlight some of those skill sets that you may not be able to really highlight in the resume because the resume requirements are really lengthy and sometimes hard to read for us selecting officials. So that's my guidance. Do, do follow the resume instructions to the T just so you can make the panel and I can see you. Maybe provide that customized cover letter where you highlight some of those activities or skill sets that are somewhat buried in the resume. Yeah, I'll follow up on that. I think the resumes that have really stood out to me are beautifully formatted. I think what stands out to people depends a little bit on their personality. I'm very much a person who loves organization, everything in its place. So if you have nested bullet points, italicized or bolded headers, things like that, that just makes it so much easier on us as a review panel to pick out the important key things that you want us to know about yourself on that resume things that are unique experiences or leadership positions you've had. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to only be related to meteorology. Like Jennifer said, if you've worked in something like customer service, oh my God, if I was a waitress, if you put on there that you have worked in retail or a server, I know that you have the patience like nobody else. And so that stands out too, because so much of what we do in the weather service boils down to good customer service. So that's something that can stand out too. So don't discount that experience. Um, and then I will also uh, reemphasize having sections for leadership, volunteer positions, research that you've presented or conducted, even if it's through your classes, not necessarily a research assistantship. And then I also want to echo Jennifer's point that a cover letter is such a necessary way to show that you routinely go above and beyond. It's not one of those required documents in USA Jobs, but 
a lot of people submit cover letters. So if you don't submit one, then we don't really get that introduction to you ahead of time. We have to wait if we choose to interview you for that. Um, so it's a way to introduce yourself, your priorities and your values, things that aren't necessarily listed in your resume, or it's an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into some of the experiences in your resume. Um, and then for the portion of the question, what stands out poorly? Um, that would be either something that is very short and nondescript, where it's just literally where you went to school and a list of clubs, um, if that, or if it's just a block of text. So that is what the USA Jobs formatter looks like to us. It is just a block of text, and it is very arduous to sort through that. But, you know, you also have to, I have to keep in mind myself that, you know, this is just someone wanting to make sure that they get referred, not wanting to leave any information out. So that's why they use that formatter. So it's, it's a bit of a coin toss for me on that one. Um, agree with everything that Katie and, and Jennifer have, uh, have stated. Uh, Katie, I'm like you, I, I'm a stickler for a very nice uh, and organized uh, resume. I, at one point I used a, a markup language called LaTeX to actually generate my, uh, my my resume, but then I found out, hey, Google has a ton of resume templates, so um, Google Tree, so I, I would certainly encourage you uh, to leverage that. Um, you know, for, for me, that's the big thing. If, if it's organized, I can clearly see, okay, these are the leadership attributes that you have. This is your experience. This is where you went to school. That's very easy for, for the selecting official to go through and say, okay, these are, these are sort of the things that this, this individual offers. If it's a huge, um, you know, if it's just blocks of text, um, you know, personally, I, I find that to be a little bit annoying. I think, I think there, it actually shows a lot of skill if you can kind of really boil down and be succinct about, okay, this is what I bring to the table. I, I think that's a, a skill, and that's something that we certainly, uh, at times, you need <laughs> in our position when you're briefing partners. They don't want, want to necessarily know every single thing. They, they want to know, hey, what's important? Uh, you know, what are some areas where, uh, okay, this is the worst case scenario? You know, information like that. So that, that kind of is mirrored to me in a, in a nice, succinct uh, resume. Uh, so yeah, the, the, big, the big turnoff is if there's a bunch of text. Um, it's interesting as it pertains to cover letters because I've had this conversation uh, with several MICs. Uh, some are very split. Some are, are very um, against uh, cover letters. I don't think it's ever disqualified someone from a job, but, you know, they get a cover letter and they say, oh, we kind of discard it. On the other hand, <laughs> some are like, we absolutely love cover letters because it shows that you're really, really interested in the job. And it's a supplemental piece of information. Um, you know, the interview is a way to get to know someone. And I think the cover letter certainly ought, can augment that uh, as well. I can tell you personally for just about all of the weather service positions that I've applied for, I, I put in a cover letter. And actually, when I um, first got into the weather service, I was trying to get into the weather service. Um, you know, once I found out that I made panels, I actually mailed <laughs> uh, some of the cover letters just to show that, hey, I was really interested in, in this position. Now, some, uh, I, I got a little bit of feedback on that. Some was like, hey, we really like that you did this. Uh, other places, I, I heard cricket. So it, it really kind of depends on the, on the selecting official and the selecting uh, team as to whether or not you should submit a cover letter. In my opinion, it doesn't hurt, uh, but for some people, um, it, it doesn't really add a lot of value to you. So just, just be aware of that. And so this, this is Christine again. Um, one thing that I wanted to add is just kind of what Lamont Mont just said. Cover letters might not necessarily help if, if the selecting officials are anti-cover letter, but I don't think they ever hurt you. The one thing that can hurt you is if you send a cover letter that's for the wrong position. I've seen those. You send a cover letter that's for the wrong office. Um, that can hurt you. Like my, like I got one that was my my number one choice office is X. Well, where you're not your number one choice. That's interesting. So think about it from that perspective. And I know that sometimes there's a group of offices that you that you can apply for at once. It's all the same vacancy announcement. You can only put one cover letter up. Um, and so my, in my experience, when I did that, I try, I, you have to make it a little more general because you're applying for multiple offices, but, but don't list your preference of offices. <laughs> um, just, just, yeah, stay far away from that. Um, and make sure that you have someone read it and look for typos and things of that sort. 
Um, one other thing that I've seen, and I don't know that, that younger people do this as much, but don't don't send it to dear sirs. <laughs> I've seen that a couple times because you know there are women in the leather service. Um, and what the other thing that I was going to mention is when I make my resumes, I have blocks with headers like major accomplishments. And then I went through and I put, I had four categories of what I was really trying to um, go towards. And obviously I'm older, but things like um, leadership, leadership. And then the next one was decision support services and things of that sort. So that when the selecting official sees them, it's super easy for you, for them to look at it. Because if you think about it, sometimes we're looking at 40 resumes for one position. And if if you don't stand out and you might just not make that second cut. Um, is there anything that that anyone else in the panel wanted to say before we went to the next question? I was just going to add, um, you, you know, you mentioned, uh, Christine, and I think it's a really good point. You know, sometimes you do when you're applying, often it's for a, a group of offices. When I applied, I think it was over 80. Um, and as a selecting official, I recognize that, you know, if, if I'm, uh, you know, if, you, if you've caught my eye in terms of your resume and I'm interviewing you or whatever, um, in the back of my mind, I know that there are other offices that you're probably um, interested in. There are occasional people that you meet that have only applied for one office. Maybe they're from the area. So don't, don't necessarily be afraid. Um, don't think that if you're a little bit more generic, that's, that's, going, to, that's going to hurt you. Because, I, again, I think at least for me in the back of my mind, I know that you're applying for, for multiple positions. Um, I did have something I wanted to add, and that is make sure you have refer references available for us. Um, and then also, I think it's really critically important for you to have a discussion with the people that you list as references to find out what they are going to say about you before you list them, because I think nobody wants to be surprised by what their reference is going to say about them. Um, I've had a few times where I've called maybe a professor or somebody and, and had that conversation, and I was a little surprised at what I heard from a reference that somebody had listed. So I'm not asking you to mislead hiring officials, but I think everybody wants to put their best foot forward. So have that crucial conversation, and and if it is somebody that may be a little more critical of you, take that in and understand that that's data that you can use to make yourself better in the future, but also maybe look at somebody else for a reference. That's a really important point to have, reference, especially, you know, references of that, that will really sell, you know, what your skills are. Um, not, I've had a few times where references listed were people that really didn't add anything. Um, so you want to make sure your references are going to be favorable, as Jennifer said, um, and that they really are going to help sell your application and are not, you know, your aunt's cousin who said that they would give you a, a reference. Anything else before we go to the final question? This has been really great so far. Thank you so much to the panelists for volunteering to do this. Um, so the last question is, and this also partly came from um, the new hires that we had at the office, but beyond meteorology, what other skills do you see being important for success in National Weather Service now and in the future? How do you envision entry-level and lead meteorologist position evolving over the next 10 years? Yeah, so I think first and foremost, beyond meteorology, it's going to be communication. It's so much more than just knowing how to forecast. That's almost kind of baseline now with models available for free on the internet. A lot of people have experience looking at those with forecasting. What's really going to help set you apart is can you help translate this? Do you have experience creating graphics with social media um, and just really showing that foundation of communication that we can build on it. Big thing you'll hear if you haven't interacted much with the Weather Service before is called Decision Support Services. So it's us helping 
what we call partners, which could be emergency managers, broadcast meteorologists, departments of transportation, um, public works, others help make their decisions and how their jobs and their lives might be impacted by the weather. So being able to translate that into usable and actionable information is going to be essential. Another big push over the next 10 years in the weather service is going to be probabilistic forecasting. So having some sort of background in statistics might be helpful as well. Um, again, that's something that your science and operations officers like Lamont and myself will help train you up in, but it certainly wouldn't hurt to have that. Um, let's see, I wrote down some notes here. Uh, more flexibility and collaboration, being a part of a team and helping work with others. You're going to be collaborating with offices around you. You're going to be collaborating with regional and national offices. So those are some great skills you can start to build now that will prepare you for what the role is currently and what the role will be. Uh, yeah, uh, Katie, I think you hit all the, the major points that, you know, I, I think I was going to, to bring up, but the communication absolutely is, uh, is, is critical. Again, everyone can look at model guidance, um, you know, everyone can look at radar, but if you can't communicate that to, to get our, our core partners in the public to make a decision, uh, then that's not really useful. You know, I would still um, advocate, even though, you know, most offices have a, an information technology officer or an ITO. Uh, you know, having some sort of background in computer science is also important. Uh, you never know what sort of application, um, you know, if you're a computer programmer, uh, you never know what sort of application, uh, you know, you can come up with. Uh, one of our meteorologists here, uh, GS5, um, has <laughs> written several programs that we, we used operationally during the monsoon season uh, last year. And so those computer science skills are also uh, really, really important uh, in addition to the, the items that Katie listed. So I have a couple of thoughts about this. One, I, I would encourage anyone applying for any position in the weather service to be prepared, not just for the application, but for the interview process. So getting your application in, make, meeting all those resume requirements, and then getting in front of the hiring official, that's your first gate. But your second gate is getting through the interview. And Many times I interview people that are not prepared for an interview. So I recommend practicing that, really sitting down and having some people go through that interviewing process with you and um, be prepared for that. One thing that you'll hear on hopefully every interview for weather service jobs is a question on diversity because our agency needs to be more diverse and reflect the communities that we serve. And I think every person interviewing can have a diversity answer to those questions, but be prepared for that. Don't think it's just general science related question or conflict related. Bring out a story from your own life or from your experience that reflects an answer to a diversity question. That's probably, I might be letting you in on a little secret, but please, please be ready for that in the interview. In the next 10 years, I'll tell you what I'm really looking for are people that are going to be good team members, that are going to be just fierce seekers of knowledge. Um, there's a lot of skill sets that we can develop within the office. So you may not need to have all those skill sets when you come into the weather service, but be prepared for a steep learning curve as when you first join our office and just dive into it, immerse yourself in everything, but be a good member of our team. Be ethical, have good character, get along well with others, um, uphold a high, work standard and just be ready to be prepared that you don't know it all when you're coming out of college, even if you go to grad school, because you're going to learn a heck of a lot on the job. And I want you just to be so enthusiastic about that. And, you know, good, good teamwork skills, good communication skills, good conflict resolution skills, good relationship building skills and develop your leadership skills in those first few years within the weather service. Be, be ready for that.
So one thing that that I was thinking about while the panelists were talking, and that might not be as just something to keep in mind, um, is to be careful with your personal social media, especially if you're um, like very active in the weather Twitter community. You can get yourself a lot of negative attention, and people remember that. Um, remember anything you put on the internet. I tell this to my kids. Is forever. So if you're looking at applying for jobs, just be careful with your social media because um, that can actually that can actually come back as you know a negative thing. Um, and I did have one follow up question, and some some of you might have some answers, some of you might not. But aside from operational meteorologists like five twelves and WFO positions, um, what are some other job options that people might not be aware of in the National Weather Service or NOAA that they could be looking at applying for if they're interested in meteorology? One area that I'm really seeing uh, a lack, a general lack of applicants for is probably the electronic technicians Sometimes the information technology officer positions, those are positions that are more related to maintenance activities, systems administration, hardware administration, that type of thing. But they're so critically important to a weather forecast office. Um, there are a lot of physical science, scientist positions in NOAA and in the Weather Service and some of the other NOAA labs. Um, there may be some contracting positions, especially where we are in Boulder um, with some of the labs in NOAA Boulder. So those are some other opportunities. One thing I will caution you, if you are a 1340 job series and go to like a 1301, which I think is the physical scientist or some of the other positions, it may be hard to come back to a 1340 position. We've seen that with a few people. So make sure you have your transcripts and still meet those requirements. But um, there are a lot of ways that you can contribute to the mission of the Weather Service and even of NOAA and, and still have a rewarding career with a lot of promotion potential. And for some people, the rotating shift work is very, very difficult. So it may not be your first choice, but you may look at something else that allows you to work in NOAA or work in the Weather Service and still contribute to the the mission that we have of protecting lives and property. Um, this isn't an entry-level position, but if you do start at a WFO um, and you make it to the GS-11, GS-12, there is a position at uh, airports called a CWSU meteorologist. And so if you are really passionate about working in fast paced environments. You like interacting with partners. I think that is a fantastic career option that um, you, know, you might not be aware of. There also are river forecast centers and they hire entry level positions as well. Um, so I know I'm gonna put her on the spot here, but Nicole Cass, Cass Messina, I'm so sorry, I was sure. Nicole Cass Messina has, uh, works at the Southeast River Forecast Center. So if you have any questions, um, Nicole, <laughs> I'm gonna put you, email Nicole. Um, it's literally her first name dot her last name at NOAA.gov. Um, and those are a really great pathway into the weather service. And so you get to work on forecasting, you get to work on projects. So river forecast centers are another really cool way to come into it. Yes, thank you, Nicole, um, coming through. So those are two fantastic options that you have as well. Yeah, and Katie sort of stole my, my answers as well. Um, you know, being uh, working at the Fort Worth office, we were co-located uh, with the uh, with the RFCs, and then we also had the Fort Worth Air Traffic Control Center. So those are also um, those are awesome opportunities. You know, I think when a lot of people think about applying for you know a WFO position, 
they kind of think about just the, the CONUS, but don't forget that we have offices in Alaska. We have offices in Hawaii, Guam, Puerto Rico. Um, those are also opportunities. And um, I've interacted with several people that uh, come from Alaska region, and they absolutely, uh, absolutely love it. Certainly have some challenges. Uh, if you're from the East Coast, then, you know, getting home can, can be difficult. But, you know, those people have, have made it work. And, you know, if you know, if it's something that you really want to do, if you want to get into the weather service, you know, consider consider those as an option. You know, you're going to uh, develop a lot of skills, uh, particularly in Alaska, um, that you know, WFO forecasters in the in the lower 48 may not necessarily um, you know get. You, you're going to have certainly some unique opportunities uh, there as as well. So don't forget about uh, Alaska, Hawaii, and our territories in terms of uh, WFOs. There's also NSEP, so the National Center for Environmental Protection. That's where I started. I came in from um, private sector, like I said earlier, and I was an assistant aviation forecaster, which was the entry level position at the Aviation Weather Center. And it was a great way to get into the National Weather Service, get exposed to a really unique skill set when I was when I decided I wanted to go to the weather forecast offices. It was something that aviation weather is not something that very many forecasters coming into through that path will have. Um, and it was it was really fun. It was a really fun three years. So don't if you see those, those are also um, eligible for either I cannot remember if you could apply for those right out of college, but with um, at least a minimal amount of professional time because they're entry level positions for NSEP. Um, there, there's just a lot of opportunities there. So if if you're searching on USA Jobs, if you put in 1340, you'll see every federal 1340 meteorologist position or 1301 is the series for physical scientists. 1315 is the series for hydrologists. Um, so make sure you're looking at all the ones that might be relevant to you and not focusing 100% on WFOs because there's a lot of really interesting positions out there that might not right, be right in the forecast office. And you'll have the ability to also transition over to the weather forecast office at a later time, if that's what you want to do. Um, is there anything else before we wrap this up? Um, if there's any questions in chat, to you put them in here now real quick and we can try to answer them. Yeah. One final thing I'll say as you apply and whether you're successful or not, always ask for feedback. I think that really stands out. Um, you know, whatever the decision is as a selection maker, there's hopefully something you can learn and take away from it. So definitely ask for feedback and apply it too. And so hopefully that'll help you continue to make those improvements and we'll see you in the weather service someday soon. And just to add, if you, if you put an application in and you don't make it through to the selecting officials, um, try to figure out what I think you can actually email them, correct me if I'm wrong, um, to see what disqualified you and correct that. Don't, it, it, you know, there's people that have been in the National Air Service for 20 years that, that have trouble with that because it's so specific. So make sure you're asking why um, you didn't make it to the selecting official and then you can adjust your resume to meet that criteria. We do have one question so far. Um, they wanted to know what the job benefits the NWS offers, like retirement or time paid off, time paid off and vacation. And the benefits are actually really good from my perspective. Um, so for your first three years, and please someone correct me if I'm wrong, you get four hours of sick leave and four hours of annual leave per pay period. There are 26 pay periods per year. When you get to three years, it goes up to six hours of annual leave. You stay at four for sick leave. And at 15 years, it goes up to eight hours. So, for example, I get 26 days of annual leave per year um, and then four hours of sick leave per pay period. So whatever 26 times four is. Can't do that in my head that fast. Um, and then retirement, you um, have matching. The TSP, it's 5%, right? Up to 5%. Okay. And then you also are paying into a pension that you can get when you retire. And that is, if you retire at 30 years, you get 1% for every year of that you were in the National Weather Service. Um, but there, there's more to it than that, but that's just kind of a really broad overview of what type 
of um, benefits. Did you guys want to add anything? <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll jump in and just say that we all hear about the gender wage gap. There is none in the weather service. I'm very proud of that um, because my male c- counterparts that are the same grade as I am are making the same money. And I think that's just critically important to gender equity. And um, the promotion potential is very, very high. Sometimes you do have to sacrifice by moving, but, you know, or you can stay put and still make a, a, a wage that your family can be supported on. We also have the medical benefits. We have health insurance. We have dental insurance. You can even take supplemental coverage if you need that for vision, additional dental. Um, We even have long-term care insurance. It's very expensive, but you can do that if you're concerned about that. Paying into the thrift savings program is just extremely important for when you do retire. I also think it's critically important that you conserve as much sick leave as possible through your years in the weather service. None of us wants to have either a family medical emergency or a medical conditions ourselves. But if you've been judicious with the use of your sick leave throughout your career, you you may be able to get through that illness and have all of your absent time from work paid for without missing any uh, paychecks or any of those medical benefits. We also now have the paid parental leave in the weather service and all the federal government. So that applies to both men and women who are becoming parents. And it doesn't matter if you have one child or if you have a whole bus full of kids, that applies to everyone. And I'm very happy that we have the opportunity to provide that today because I had both of my children when I was in the weather service and I had to use my annual leave and my sick leave and had some time that was unpaid. So those are the a few of the other benefits that I can think of that may be important to our audience. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is there any other questions that anyone has real quick that we could address? And um, if you have questions afterwards and you want to email me, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Um, Feel free to reach out to me. And um, if it's a question I can't answer, I can seek out the panelists to get the answer. Um, So it says, does the Weather Service still give assistance with moving between offices? Does one of the panelists want to answer that? So I, I'll jump in and I will say when you apply for jobs and you see the vacancy announcement, it will tell you if PCS, and that stands for permanent change of station, if those benefits are provided. Generally, once you're in the weather service and you apply for a promotion or a, a different position, that PCS is usually paid for, but not always. Um I mentioned earlier the 5 through 12 program. We now have a a mobility agreement. So if somebody wants to apply for kind of a lateral jump and we can do that, that PCS may not be paid for. One of the benefits with that moving that um, we're not offering anymore is the third party buyout of homes. So that becomes a little more difficult when it's not a seller's market for housing. But um, sometimes the third party hasn't been great for home sellers anyway. I I had a few experiences with it where it's a little tricky, but um, so you're going to have to sell your own house. But there are still moving benefits. And if you want to move to another area, definitely consider taking advantage of that because I think it's really, really Great. I I will say I've moved around quite a bit in my career and I've enjoyed every location that I've worked in and made good friends in every every location. Thank you, Jennifer. Is there anybody else real quick that has a question? I know we've gone a little bit long. All right, I don't see any additional questions. But like I said, if you want to reach out to me or any of the panelists, um, 
that they've put their email in the chat. That's totally fine. And then also we will be uploading this entire webinar to um, the Bogum YouTube channel. And so you'll be able to access it there if there's something you want to look back to in the presentation. But again, if you have any questions about that part as well, um, you can reach out to me and I can, can help you out with that. But I greatly, greatly appreciate all the panelists volunteering their time to be here. Um, and give this really useful information to people that are aspiring to be National Weather Service meteorologists. And thank you everyone for attending. We definitely appreciate you also attending. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you again, panelists. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one.